Welcome to the Key Chapters of the Bible podcast. This is a daily podcast that's going through the key chapters of God's Word. When we turn from God, does He turn from us? No. In fact, He calls us back to Himself. And today we're turning to Isaiah chapter 1. We're going to see just how devoted God is to His people and how He calls them back to repent and fellowship with Him. Hello again, I'm Russ Brewer, and you are listening to episode 148 in our study in the key chapter of the Bible. And today we're turning to a completely new section of Scripture, the prophets. We're just going to see God's message to His people, calling them back to fellowship with Him. Now, for the last five months, we've been working through the historical records of the children of Israel. We have seen God just making his covenants with mankind, starting with Adam, then Noah, then Abraham, then Moses, and David. These covenantal promises were simply that God's judgment is going to come on this world because of our sinful rebellion, but how God would preserve us out of that judgment if we would covenant with him and follow him and be his people. And so as we've been working through the Bible, we're just seeing the message of these covenants unfold. First, you have the Pentateuch, where God makes the covenant with his people. Then you have the historical records that show what happens under the terms of that covenant. Then you have the wisdom literature, which is just showing us how to walk according to the covenant and fellowship with God. And now we're going to conclude our time in the Old Testament in this section of prophetic literature that records God's calls to his people to return back to fellowship with him and to their terms of the covenant. And so we're now starting a new section of scripture called the prophets. We've already read about some of God's prophets, like Elijah and Elisha and Micaiah. But those men were not writing prophets. Uh, Today we're turning to those that were writing. Uh, We'll focus mostly on Isaiah and Jeremiah, Ezekiel and Daniel, but also some minor prophets too. And we'll see in their words the holy standards of the Father as well as his loving efforts to save them. Now when we think of the term prophet, we should not think of something along the lines of a fortune teller. The prophet's primary role in the Old Testament was to call the children of Israel back to the God of the covenant. Uh, Most of their message was forthtelling as opposed to foretelling. Foretelling is when God inspires a prophet to foretell events that were yet to happen. Forthtelling is when God inspired a prophet to teach his message and call the people back to him. And as we study the prophet's messages, we're going to see that the main calling was this foretelling. Though Isaiah, for instance, will have both kinds of foretelling and foretelling, and the times that God does tell what's going to come, it's just stunning in its accuracy. So let's turn our focus to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah's name means the Lord is salvation, and that's just a great summary of this book. The message of this book is about how God is promising to bring both judgment for their sins and salvation upon them because of his mercy. The prophet Isaiah ministered for about 55 years from roughly 739 BC to about 686 BC. Chapter 1 verse 1 tells us that he prophesied during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. And this is important to know because Isaiah was a prophet to the southern kingdom of Judah And these were all Judean kings. Uzziah was also called Azariah, and under his rule, Judah prospered. However, Uzziah was prideful, and the people were greedy. Jotham was his son, and during his reign, Judah still prospered, but the people were still greedy. Ahaz was an evil king. He fought against Israel. He united with Assyria. He brought pagan idolatry into the Lord's temple. He sacrificed, meaning like he killed his own son. And when he died, the people refused to bury him with the other kings. Hezekiah was the son of Ahaz, but he was a reformer. He cleared Jerusalem of its false idolatry. He stood against the Assyrians, and the Lord delivered him from Sennacherib, and you read about that in 2 Kings 18 and 19. Now, all of this sets up the backdrop of the message of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah has several key themes that we'll unpack as we go through this book, but one of the key themes is about the kingdom of God, specifically that God had made a covenant with the Jewish people, and he would be their king, and they would be his citizens. And yet they have rebelled against their covenant with God. And so the prophet Isaiah is calling the people back to obedience to him. And as this book unfolds, we'll see that the restoration of God's people will have to be brought about by the coming kingdom of God ruled by the Messiah who will establish a true obedience to the Lord. And so in terms of an outline of this book, the first 39 chapters of the book of Isaiah continue this mounting indictment against the Jewish people with warning about God's coming judgment. There's something of a pause between chapters 39 and 40. And when chapter 40 starts on up, now Judah is facing God's judgment head on. And the Lord is then calling people to look to the Messiah for him to provide salvation, to establish this kingdom, to restore Zion to the Lord so that all might know God through a new covenant. And so chapter 1 begins this indictment against the kingdom of Judah. Let's look at some of these verses, just seeing just how this chapter comes together. Verse 1 is that timestamp of the book of Isaiah, just placing Isaiah's ministry during the time of these kings. Then in verse 2, 
Isaiah summons the heavens and the earth to hear the complaint of the Lord. And we should just always know that whenever God is going to call the heavens and the earth in judgment against us, we really need to take it seriously. And they really should have been. And so in verse 2, he says, Sons I have reared and brought up, but they have revolted against me. An ox knows its owner, and a donkey its master's manger. Israel does not know. My people do not understand. Now let's pause for a moment here because verse 3 mentions Israel. But we know from verse 1 this is a message to Judah. And you'll remember that this is during the time of the divided kingdom. And the northern kingdom is called Israel and the southern kingdom is called Judah. And so is God referring to Israel and Judah here? Well, here we're seeing that often, especially from the perspective of God, these two nations were one people tied together in their covenant to him and also tied together in the rebellion against him. And so he's really talking about Judah here. And in verse 4, he describes his people as those who have been weighed down with iniquity. They have abandoned the Lord. They have despised God and turned away from him. And this, of course, is just how all sin begins. When we turn from God and just start doing our own thing. And verses 5 and 6 point to just how thoroughly given over to sin they are. And then verses 7 and 9 give what is probably a prophetic warning of what is to come. Because remember, at this point, Judah is still prosperous. And so Isaiah is seeing a judgment that is coming. And he says in verse 7, Your land is desolate. Your cities are burning with fire. Strangers devour your fields and overrun your society. In verse 8, Zion is like a shelter in the vineyard with very few survivors. And in verse 10, he calls them rulers of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, you'll remember how God rained down judgment upon Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis 19. And so Isaiah is calling them rulers of Sod and people of Gomorrah, just showing how sinful they are and warning them of the fate that they are looking at. In verse 11, they've just had this facade of worship and the Lord is tired of it. He says he takes no pleasure in their false worship. To him, in verse 12, it's just a trampling in his courts. And so he tells them in verse 13, don't bring your worthless offerings any longer. Uh, Your incense is an abomination, an abomination to me. In verse 14, he says, I hate, what an incredibly stern phrase, or I hate your new moon and your festivals, and they are a burden to me. Then in verse 15, when you spread out your hands in prayer, I'll hide my face from you. You, Basically, you can pray all you want, but I'm not going to listen. Why? Verse 15, because your hands are covered in blood. In other words, the way you live when you're not at all these festivals, it just renders all of this so-called worship as being just fake. And God hates false, fake, hypocritical worship. So what are they to do? Well, verses 16 and 17 give us a window. He says, wash your hands, make yourselves clean, remove the evil of your deeds from my sight, cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, reprove the ruthless, defend the orphan, plead for the widow. In other words, repent and do what you should have been doing all along. This is a theme that we've been seeing throughout the New Testament. Repentance means a change of life. It's not just saying the words, I'm sorry, but living a life that aligns with righteousness. And so we see God's offer of mercy and forgiveness to those who repent in verse 18. He says, come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. This is just a beautiful picture of true forgiveness and what it looks like where our sins are washed away and the stain of our sins is fully and completely removed. In verse 19, if they consent and obey, they'll have abundant prosperity. But in verse 20, if they continue to rebel, they'll be devoured by the coming judgment. But then, even in God's judgment, we still see God's mercy in verses 25 and 26. When the Lord turns his hand against these folks, he will do it in such a way that he's going to remove the dross from from them. Basically, that impurity within the metal, he's going to scoop out, clean out all of that impurity He'll restore their judges. He'll restore their wise counselors. And one day they will be called a city of righteousness and a faithful city. Now, how will this happen? This future redemption of Zion will happen through an act of justice, it says, where God's justice is fully meted out and fully completed. Now, we know that that points to the cross, which is the only place where God's justice could be fully meted out and fully completed. And so to those who will look to the cross and repent, they will be clothed in righteousness. And when God's ultimate judgment comes, they will be saved. But in verses 28 and 29, those who refuse will be crushed by God and ashamed of all of the prosperity they once enjoyed. It will be turned against them as proof of their sin and their rebellion. And in verse 31, all of it will burn. So that's chapter one in a nutshell. Uh, Basically, Israel has violated the terms of the covenant. And even though they are children of God, they act like strangers. They have perpetuated a false system of worship, and it only serves to judge them. 
And so God, their loving Father, calls them to repent. And if they will not repent, they will face his judgment, which we know to be the coming invasion of Babylon. But even then, there will still be a, a way of repentance and forgiveness later. But those who reject that judgment will ultimately find that their blessings and their things that they chased after this world will ultimately serve as judgment against them in the final day. Well, that's a lot to chew on. And as we read Isaiah chapter 1, it's pretty clear God takes his covenant seriously. He's not okay when people disregard it. And so as we just wrap up our time in Isaiah chapter 1, I think a logical application of this passage is simply to ask the question, are you in a covenant relationship with God? He is warning here that there is a coming judgment upon this earth. Now, for the Jews, it was just right then and there. But there's, this is also pointing to the ultimate fulfillment here. And God is saying he will grant forgiveness to those who are in covenant with him to be his citizen people. He'll, he'll forgive us of our sins. He'll wash us of our sins. He'll pay the debt that our sins incurred. But we still have to be in covenant with him. And although entering into this covenant is unconditional, still the understanding is that we will be his kingdom citizens abiding by the terms of the new covenant that we find in the New Testament. So the question is, are you living by those terms? Uh, is your life aligned with what we see in Scripture in terms of the standards of holiness and righteousness? If not, well, this call to the people of Israel to repent is also for you and I today. If we are in covenant with God and if we are doing the stuff that's disobeying God, he is calling us to repent. The fact is, all of us have stuff we need to work on. All of us have places where we ought to be repenting and just further being transformed to be like Christ. And yet, as New Covenant Christians, we also have the promise of 1 John 1, 9, which I love this verse. It says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The Lord wants to cleanse us, and he calls us to come to him for that cleansing, for that washing that we see here even in Isaiah chapter 1. Well, that wraps up our time in Isaiah chapter 1. As we finish on out, how about just spending some time with the Lord, asking for his grace, praising for his grace, asking for his work in our life to renew us in his ways, to keep us from hypocrisy and false worship, just so that we delight in our Lord and King and Father. We'll end things there. Thanks so much for listening. Hope you have a great rest of your day. God bless.